Welcome everybody to a Equinoctal Vibrant. Super excited about tonight's hangout. As Cucumber in the chat so wisely said, this is the part of YouTube that is nice. <laughs> it's a really cool community. I see everyone piling into the chat. I love you guys. Super excited. It's my birthday week. Technically the day is Friday. I'm gonna be 35. And it's just, everything's lining up for me. I got that birthday chi, solar return, good energy. And uh, lucky for me, because my name means luck, I was able to get Eileen in on kind of a last minute request and she was able to jump in, even though it's her third podcast of the day. She's in high demand. And uh, one of my favorite wingmen to ever bring on to Vibrant, Kyle Denton of Typical New Herbs is here. So what's up everybody and welcome Eileen. Last time we did this, it was my birthday last year. So I kind of appreciate you being my birthday buddy since this is, uh, you're my favorite guest to have on. I just don't like to abuse the privilege. I love that. I love being able to celebrate your birthday with you and a new friend, Kyle, who I haven't met yet. Yes, it's great to meet you Eileen and, uh, and awesome to be here. Chance, thanks so much for the invitation. I am feeling so blessed to be on the screen with two mentors that have elevated my herbal practice to a new dimension. And I have such respect uh, for, for the work that you do. And I'm so excited to be talking about it tonight. So yeah, it's great to be here. Nice. It is so great. Honestly, the gift that I wanted to give myself was to witness you two have some interaction. Uh, Kyle, you know, introducing to Eileen, what it is you do and all the variety of air sign, Aquarian, weird, automatic, knowing how to do stuff that you've got going on, what you've integrated from, uh, you know, the, the biofield anatomy into your practice, all that kind of stuff. It'd be really fun to talk about. So kind of just going to let you take it. Sweet. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm an herbalist. I just call myself a community herbalist. So that way there's not a lot of extra baggage, but I have a long history of, um, clinical work and I do a lot of medicine making. I have a, a shop in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. If you ever come to Milwaukee for whatever reason, please let me know. I'd be, I would love to show you around. And, um, and so one of the things that I was, I learned about your work from chance a long time ago, got your tuning forks uh, a year and a half ago or something like that. Started playing around with them and it was, it was fun at first and just, you know, uh, seeing what I could feel. I ended up really falling in love with the sonic slider. And then last, was it last year or two years ago, I got all of my staff a sonic slider for Christmas. Like that's, that was a great, <laughs> so whatever they're like, Oh, I got a headache or something. It's like, get the sonic slider. Um, use the forks, Luke. Use the forks. <laughs> and so, you know, I, um, I, I have your book behind me here. I have uh, uh, all of your podcasts. I've, I've pretty much listened to them all. I've listened to, I just love your, the way that you put out so much work and um, the encouragement that everyone can, has the capability of, you know, learning these skills. And I really appreciate that you have created your own uh, school to teach uh, the way that you do it. And I also appreciate Chance, the way that he has kind of taken, uh, a, you know, a, an approach where he's integrated some of the things that he's he's doing as well with tarot cards and uh qigong things like that so i just decided yeah, i'm gonna start integrating uh tuning into my clinical practice and it was you know i have in my in my work i have it's it, it wasn't a big jump for me because i have a uh an understanding already of working with the causal field like in my in my um in-person sessions when i'm testing for the remedies I'm actually writing down uh, the herb that I'm that I think that they might need, putting it on a piece of paper and putting it in their hand while I'm feeling their pulse. And you know, there's a jump sometimes, there's a there's a, a shy away, and then everything settles in. And I try to find is this the right remedy? And it can't really be explained through <laughs> anything other than a cosmology that has this causal etheric field in, in, integrated into into that model. And so uh, when it came to the tuning forks, I just picked them up and I started working with uh, my clients in a way where I am now. I mean, I could sit with somebody in a in a uh, session for 90 minutes and we can be talking about their 
other things. And I got herbs on my mind and I'm testing and I'm testing and I'm testing. But now when I got this extra measure of a tuning fork that, that you're, the work that you've done has introduced, I can find ways that, I've, that I would never have thought of perceiving in a diagnostic way. And additionally, I am really, really excited about the sonic anatomy of plants and because I'm incorporating that into my, into my tuning sessions. And one of the things that I do is uh, I'm taking like plants. Let's, I have my, my uh, I call it homunculus guy based on the chat of <laughs> uh, chance. I have my homunculus guy. It's basically at my practice practice sugar table where I'm imagining the person there. And as we're going through the session, I'm taking the herbs that I have uh, here in, in my office that I think that might be really helpful for them. I do ways of testing them through the causal, through the etheric way. And then I'm putting them onto this homunculus man or the, the, the table, the practitioner's Burn table. <laughs> and I'm actually bringing the uh, scattered uh, biophotonic field into the herbs which I will then gr either uh, prepare as a tea or prepare as a, a tincture, most usually a tincture. I put them into a what's called a percolation cone and just pour a little bit of brandy over them. And then the person has a, a bottle that I ship to them or they come pick it up right away that is made with herbs that have been infused with the, the practice, the actual uh, session. And then that way, and then also with my practice of herbalism, I'm, I'm not the so much the, the apologist for allopathic, you know, or take this herb for this thing. I feel I really feel strongly that uh, just like with uh, biofield tuning in the way that that um, both of you have um, have shown, it is it is a way of integrating, you know, taking taking our own lessons and um, integrating them ourselves, finding that story for ourselves. So that's how I, I work with the herbs. The herbs are there to assist us to, through these changes and it's been it's been amazing i have had nothing but ex incredible incredible success since i've been doing that and i've only been doing it uh professionally with you know clients and for just a few months so i'm very very much a novice when it comes to the the tuning in a clinical setting but i have my uh, you know i have my chops when it comes to the clinician stuff so it's been really fun. I feel like I've had enough initiation into <laughs> the mysteries of of tuning that I'm like, wow, this there's some weird stuff going on here. Um, so much so that it's opened up the possibility that there is way, way, way more to learn. And you know, you walk in, it's like walking through a door and seeing hundred more doors, and then walking through one of those doors and seeing that there's a hundred more. And I know just by nature of my age and uh, everything else everything like that, that that's just the way it goes. That's the way, if you're interested in learning, you'll always find more and more and more. But it's, it's beautiful to have this, uh, I don't know, this <laughs> kind of like childlike view of biofield tuning. And uh, I, I don't know, being in, uh, in this room right now with y'all is so, I'm, I'm very excited and I'm, I'm excited in general because when I'm tuning people, it just, those are the days that I feel, those are my peak days of the week. Those are the days that I feel really 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 in tune with myself too so there's more to it than just what we're offering um there's definitely a lot for for me that i that i like to claim too so that's i guess that's the beginning that's it in a nutshell that's super cool <clears throat> that you, you know I, i've heard lots of stories from different people about how they have figured out how to take the principles of tuning and integrate it into other things like that um i i know that guy was a weed grower and uh he he, his mom was super disapproving about the fact that he was a weed grower and he felt like he was bringing his own guilt and shame, even though he loved weed and he loved growing it, his own guilt and shame into the process. And so he started playing my recordings for his weed plants. So specifically, I have one on guilt and shame and, uh, and re absolutely noticed a difference in the quality of the herb and the other people did as well when they smoked it. So plants, respond really beautifully to sound to the vibes because they speak the same vibrational language that we do so it's such a wonderful way to communicate with them and work with them because you're you know at that at that level of vibrational communication it's all one language um animals too you know speak the same vibrational language so i always love seeing you know how different people get inspired to take these principles about the field and integrate it into 
the work that they're doing. It's super cool. And there is no end of discovery. I mean, I just went through a whole wave of discovery um, about how I discovered that you can access your, your star chart, your, your zodiacal chart through your biofield. And I'm working with an apprentice right now who is, we're tuning <laughs> the, the star charts of people um, which is wild. I mean, we, we, you know, bring up the chart on a, on a computer and then cast a circle and go around and you can feel every heavenly body uh, that's on the chart. You can feel it in the biofield, the 12 bands of the biofield convert into the 12 houses of the Zodiac. And uh, that's been an incredibly fascinating exploration that I feel like I've only scratched the surface of um, my, the next thing that I'm planning on doing is uh so in the, in the biofield theory, your your electrical system is a torus. It's a bubble, right? It extends about six feet around you. Um, but sort of lesser known is that it's really kind of like Russian dolls, and that we're nested within torus with you know tori, uh, basically infinitely. And um, I had an interesting experience with my husband uh, this past week because he has he injured a knee, uh, his left knee, a really long time ago. And when he works too much, he can strain himself and it starts bothering him again. And he um, just really kind of did a number on himself and uh, and he was limping around and I was like, we got to fix you somehow. And so because I'd worked on his knee, I'd worked on his hip, but it wasn't quite doing it. Well, I decided to visit the next Taurus out. So coming in from below the feet, you know, it's like you have a an energy center below the feet, what we call the earth star and biofield tuning. But if you go about three feet further down, you find another energy center that I call the deep earth. And actually you can just keep going. And so the polarization of each bubble as it goes out is reversed. And so I went and explored this area of this next Taurus out and discovered that that particular Taurus was totally jammed up. It was completely jammed up. It was all like rah, misfiring and not moving and in, in wrong relationship to the primary bubble. And so I sorted it out. I just hung out there and, and got it running right. And, uh, and he got up from that adjustment and he was able to walk normal. For me holding, and I did the whole session just with the sonic slider. Lately, I just been like, I do it all, like an entire session just with the sonic slider in the field and on the body because you can Right. So, so now I'm like, okay, I want to actually like get a practice buddy and go to the, you know, the second, the third, the fourth, I'm going to go all the way to the 33rd one. That's, that's where my intuition is telling me to go. And what happens when we investigate each one of these radiating, expanding Tauruses. So um, I have no end of fascination and inspiration. And I've been doing this for 28 years now. And it's still beckoning me down different, you know, pathways of possibility. Wow. That's like an entire Saturn cycle, <laughs> you know, 28 years of experience. So it's yeah. almost like you're reaching a point where coming back to where you started with new eyes, does it ever feel that way? Well, certainly going into this Zodiac tuning felt like um, like the sort of mind blown, right? Because the whole process of discovering the biofield and sort of creating biofield tuning was like, my mind was blown over and over and over again. I was like, this is so fascinating. This is so curious. This is so weird. Um, and I love that, right? I love in a world where it feels like everything has been explored to be exploring territory that's sort of hidden in plain view and like what you can do in that, those subtle realms. Um, I feel like we're just scratching the surface really of, of what is possible if, with tinkering with the biofield for good. Cause they're certainly out there tinkering with the biofield for not good. So it's really up to us to counterbalance that. I think. I, I actually learned how to do tuning with a sonic slider. It kind of reminds me, maybe pardon the analogy, but when I learned how to play the guitar, I have the guitar that I learned how to play on still, and I go back to it and I'll play it and I'll be like, how did I ever get a tone out of this? And I don't mean to, I say pardon the comparison because your instrument is excellent, the one that you've manufactured. But so I learned how to tune on a sonic slider because when I started tuning, I had a, a, an infant child 
And if I would hit the <laughs> hit the fork, he would wake up. And uh, because he's just so interested, he just he like really gets really it's he uh, loves tuning things too, by the way. And, um, and he has such a great frequency when like when he hits a fork, I can never get the type of ring that's so true. And it's just like so clumsy with his big old hands ting, and it's just such a perfect ring because he's got he doesn't have any of the nonsense in his uh, true to true to nature system. So learning how to do it with the sonic slider, I was thinking, wow, I, I um, I'm doing this based off of feel. This isn't there's not uh, there's not a uh, audible component to this at all. And so when I added the audible component, it was just like you know it, it accelerated. But I have um. I have this poster. Chance, could you make me big for a second, please? This is um, the monochord that I just learned about from Robert Flood. Ro ro sorry, Robert Fudd. Um, and Renas Renaissance era, kind of um, trying to make something about the encyclopedia. I hang this in my, in my room here because the monochord represents, <clears throat> this is kind of like an, a sonic anatomy. And I don't know if you're familiar with this. I don't claim to have much expertise on this at all. Um, I really appreciate the idea that you were talking about with the uh, nesting toroids that we have here. We have, you know, one cosmic egg shape. So uh, what this represents is uh, musica mundana, which is the music of the spheres as it's relating to um, us humans, as opposed to the musica um, humana. And then there's musica instrumental instrumentali, which is like the the instruments that we make to try to re recreate um, nature. And then right here at the top, it's just one single string, and um, and it's so complicated. There's you know there's the there's the notes, there's the um, the elements, there's the um, planets, there's angels, angelic realms, and everything like that. But it's just one string. Behind me, I have a, a twelve string guitar, and it's way less complicated than mm. this one string <laughs> instrument. And up here is the divine hand of God, the creator that tunes it. And it reminds me of so, so many things. It reminds me of the, um, it reminds me of um, when, an, when a string is, is in vibrational pattern, there's the nadis, you know, the serpentine like movement uh, vibrating, but s singular string that re represents like the shashumna or the, your line that goes to your crater. And so I have this on my wall to remind me about the, um, the potential for macrocosmic, microcosmic, um, from the individual to the plants, to the cosmos, as you were talking about with the astrological. Um, and so I guess a question that I have for you is, um, considering the hermetic, the second hermetic axiom, you know, of as within, so without, as above, so below, and um, noticing that, you know, when we tune ourselves, that there is something that we're maybe that we have a there is a reflection that might be happening in heaven as, as well. And I'm just wondering um, if you have any thoughts on that or if you have any experience with, I don't know, the, the I'm not talking about like necessarily like cosmological shifts, but just a, a greater macrocosmic shifts that that occur when working with and working with the intention of working at macro scopically, I guess. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> it's hard to really know, right? I, I mean, with, with all of the things that are going on in the world, but what that does make me think of is kind of a funny thing. And that is um, during COVID, what I found was that <clears throat> the primary forks that I was using 174 Hertz, 528 um, and 417 weren't getting through like this sort of thick layer of fear and deception that descended on the collective consciousness of humanity. And I remember thinking that I needed a bigger gun. <laughs> I needed something that was going to like break through that rigidity that, um, you know, hadn't really been there up to that point. And I, uh, one of my favorite forks is, uh, is this 144 Hertz weighted fork. And this fork, I call it the the Yang grandmother, um, and it it is it's like a little drill. Like when I get into really stuck stuff in the field, and I go in there, this it's like ying ying ying, and it just really moves through 
what's in the field. In fact, I used to have a, a technique where I had a Lemurian crystal. And when I hit these spots that were particularly stubborn, I would hold the crystal in the spot and then I would put a weighted fork on top of it. And that created sufficient vibration to disrupt. I've done that before. It's like an intuitive idea. It makes yeah. sense to do that. Wow. Well, cool. I mean, just from a science perspective, a crystal is an amplifier. Right. So it go the, the, the frequency goes in and it comes out like, <laughs> like amplified. So, so it worked, it amplified the forks I had enough to make them do that. Um, but then, but then when I, when I got the 144 and I started using this, I never picked up the crystal again. Like I, I have, I don't even know where it is. And this was such a staple for me, this Lemurian crystal, but this 144 took the place of that. And, uh, and I, so I remember thinking, well, the 144 weighted is pretty busty through -y of things. So let me try a 144 uh, unweighted, which I created. But when I first got it and first started using it, it was a beast. Like it would, it would make the wonkiest sounds. I mean, it was, it was alarming. I even put a warning label on it. I was like, this is not a beginner fork. And I gave it to each of my 11 teachers and uh, had them them try it out. And without exception, all of them were like, uh, Eileen, what are you thinking with this work? Because it's it's alarming. It's disturbing. It's all over the place. And and I was like, no, you know, just hang in there with it and you'll tame it and it will tame you and you'll end up with a better relationship with it. And that's exactly what happened. But what was so interesting was, was within a year of it being out, it no longer had that wild all over the place thing, even for people who were new with it. So there was something about bringing that frequency into the collective and using it together over time that, that tamed it, that made it, that changed it, quite frankly. Like it, it took on a different character, even for, people who were new to it. So that's a little weird, right? <laughs> like, well, how did that happen? Maybe you, maybe you intended to, maybe it's just synchronistic, but I feel like you kind of answered Kyle's question about tuning the heavens when we <laughs> tune a, a human. I often have recounted the story of the hula hoop analogy where I used to go to a lot of music festivals. A few girls would hula hoop at these things and they were pretty good at it. But then as years went by, they, the things that they could do got just out of control. And then new girls that started hula hooping that had never done it before would jump up to the skill level of the experts in like record time. Whereas they, the, the initiators, they took a few years to get there. And I think that the, you know, like the collective unconscious or that Jungian idea, the heavens, there's something to that where as we develop a particular skill or knowledge base, it's akin to mining neural pathways in this collective consciousness. And some of us are up at the wall on the frontier chipping away. And then new people are like, oh, I want to go that way. And they can just kind of walk or jog or maybe even sprint all the way to the wall that everybody else is at. Oh, for sure. I mean, we, we talk about the morphic field of biofield tuning and how it informs new students. I mean, when I think back at like all the years that I spent mapping the biofield, all the years I spent like wondering what the heck I was doing, you know, <laughs> like this is really weird, you know, because for a really long time, I was the only one on the planet doing uh, this weird thing with tuning forks. And that was a hard hump to get over, you know, I, because it is so odd. And now there's thousands of people doing it. So it doesn't feel as odd as it used to, but new people are able to pick it up faster, you know, than my first students because the hunt, that hundredth monkey uh, concept, although somebody told me that hundredth monkey story was debunked, um, but it's still useful <laughs> for <laughs> explaining too. Yeah, how how things do get into the collective consciousness. I mean, even with sports, right? We see that in all kinds of extreme sports, what people are doing now versus 20, 30 years ago, like snowboarding, right? When we first started, like, hey, we're going to jump. And now they're like, Warrr. so the human mind and body, I'm just always so amazed by what humans can do and how we build on those who came before us. Well, there was a time where a five minute mile was insane. And then somebody ran a four minute mile and now that's like the standard for the top people. And there's people that are under four minutes, which is totally 
insane to think about. I want to kick a question to both of you uh, guys, though. One thing that I continually notice, especially as I get some mileage on on tuning experience, is that there seems to be themes, like clusters of certain types of issues show up at around the same time as each other. Often I'll, I'll do like all the clients that I do in the same week will be working on their version of a similar type of idea. And as the Equinox was coming on, I have been seeing a lot of people that they didn't even know that this was the thing they needed to work on. You know, sometimes they just come to you and they, they just say, tell me what's, tell me where it is. Tell me what, what's going on, you know, and as we're in this Aries season or entering it, the getting startedness question, it, it keeps coming up. Like people that want to switch what it is they're doing for a living typically, or to just get over inhibition to kick off new practices or, or, you know, find their way on a new path. And that resistance is different for different people, but <laughs> there are certain, you know, kind of key insights that can apply to all of us with that. And I wondered if Eileen could share some getting startedness insights as someone who's started multiple businesses successfully, and then Kyle can maybe, you know, add his thoughts and potentially even herbal, uh, you know, boosters for that type of thing. Well, I, I, I would say, Chance, I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday that I did a tuning for, and uh, and I, I, as I was feeling into her energy. Uh, just using like a right or left and left brain metaphor, like her right brain felt so creative and so sparkly and so youthful and so bursting with life, like what I call a messy creative. And her left brain was like those machines that pump oil, it, you know, <laughs> and, and she had turned into something like colonialism, Rockefeller education had turned her into a cog that was, terrified to color outside the lines and and she had become almost ocd in her need to like make everything right and perfect and inside the lines and meanwhile her solar spirit is like this incredibly like the opposite right just kind of spilling out and and i recognize that because because i'm like that i'm what i call a messy creative i'm not a perfectionist not at all. I'm an idealist through and through, but I'm not a perfectionist. And I'm totally willing to jump in and make a fool of myself, dare to suck, um, you know, just create a mess. I I'm totally comfortable with that because I understand that that's a creative process is that you have to be willing to, to do things wrong, to learn things the hard way, um, you know, to have some false starts. Um and, and not have the word failure even exist in your mind, because everything for me is a science experiment. I'm like, let's try this and see what happens. You know, let's tinker with it. Let's, let's play around with it. You know, my first version of tuning the human biofield, my first draft, it sucked. It was horrible. <laughs> I mean, oh, but, but I wrote it. I, I actually wrote the entire first draft. And then from there, I was able to work it and work it and work it and work it. Um, Everything that I created in the beginning, you know, you're learning things the hard way. So I think you have to really not be afraid of making messes. That, that, that's what I think. I think that's a really big part of it is to, to take all of this. We've all been so traumatized with this fear of doing things wrong. So that, you know, like this person I worked with, we're like so afraid to be messy. We're so afraid to be wrong. We're so afraid to do it wrong that we don't do anything. And that's, you know, that's a sorry state of affairs because we're built to be creative beings. You know, that we, we create all the time anyway. It's just what we do. We're creative. And, uh, and I think that I, I just want to give people permission <laughs> to be a messy creative. I, you know, the only reason why I have a, a, you know, why I have this line of tuning forks, I got 10 forks that I sell. I, I've got like at least 120 discarded prototypes that I was like, Oh, that's one sounds like a good idea. Let me make that frequency. And I play with it for, I'm like, me. <laughs> right? And I'm not afraid to like try something out and, uh, and not like it and not want to use it. So, um, yeah. So that's what I would say. I just get over your perfectionism and your fear and get messy and it's okay. <laughs> that's exactly it. That is totally it. I have a, a fun story about one of these clients and getting startedness from last week. And 
I hope you're enjoying the integration process, buddy, if you hear <laughs> this. But they basically, it's a similar thing, exactly what you described. I think this is what holds people back the most is fear of doing it wrong or thinking that there's a right way to do it. And uh, what we came across in his like memory banks was that he was really into drawing as a kid. And this was not really at the forefront of his mind at all uh, coming into the session, but we found this specific moment where he had been drawing for years just for fun, making cartoons and everything. And I don't know, it was maybe around the year nine, nine years old or something that his mother put him into a art class, like a drawing class. And great. That's a great idea, you know, to, to get training, get, new inspiration that way. But the experience seemed to have had an effect of the comparison from how he liked to do things to what is the right way to do things. And that that put a bit of a break on his <laughs> willingness to initiate doing things his own way. And he hadn't made that connection yet. And it was a pretty cool connection that the replacement belief about it all that I, uh, that I think anyone could take on right now, regardless of what might be in their memory field, this can override a lot of that stuff is my way is the right way. And you can, that sounds like blasphemy to some people, but the case is that like, if you are a trustworthy person, if you're a person of moral integrity and you can trust yourself, then there's no reason why your way shouldn't be the right way. That's totally fine. And as you said, you can always make adjustments, but you have to take steps. But the funny thing about finding the, the kid who loved drawing in his energy field was that he realized after we went through that, that just a few days prior, his mom had dug up an old notebook of drawings from that age that had been lost, like forgotten in storage and gave it to him just out of the blue. So it was like, come, it, there's these external world reflections that match what we're doing in the inner world. And that happens so much. And it's one of the things that tells me we're on to the real juice of like how <laughs> how life the psyche and uh spirit and matter intersect and reflect super cool yeah i see that all the time this weird alignment with the inner and i guess it's not weird you know but um it definitely uh it's all one right it, as within so without um and and this idea that the the like our star chart like the stars up there like they're right here Right? When people talk about, well, how can the heavenly bodies inform us? But they absolutely, they're electromagnetic and they absolutely electromagnetically imprinted on us when we were born, you know, into our biofields and they're close, <laughs> they're like right around us. So there's, um, there's, so I, I think, to, you know, to come back to your question, Kyle, I think there is really no way that we can affect the inside and, and affect humanity in a significant way and not have it be a reciprocal relationship with the larger cosmos. Thanks. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I have some ideas about uh, getting started too, because I also have a business and I have an idealist <laughs> like uh, personality. And the, one of the things about me is I'm also not a perfectionist, but the idealist can be weighed down by perfectionism. Um, in in time so the one of the things that i think about is a plant called blue vervain which i put in my astro herbal um, zodiacal uh, scape i put it as an aquarius herb because specifically this is the herb that i would put in the right ankle of the body something that is the angle between um our our spiritual uprightness that we have this uh, advantage as you know, God's God's uh, creation that separates us from the animals, and then also that right ankle is the thing that you know we have to pick up and make the the right move. We have to make the right step, and uh, that could also be the place where we where people in Aries time of year also trying to feel um, like they've got to get started. Like which uh, like how do, how do I make a move? How do I make a move? So Blue Vervain comes to mind. Another thing that comes to mind is how do you how do you spell that one? V E R V A I N blue vervain blue vervain is also a great helpful plant for releasing tension in the neck and the, and the head. It's a nervine. It's not sedative, but it's helpful for, to me, it's the list. I call it the list maker plant. It's the plant for the person who likes to make all kinds of lists and has like, 
they also like to make lists for other people too. I'm a blue vervain person myself. I like to make lists for other people. I also like to make the list in the way that that's it. It's all, I call it the plate spinner plant. Look at the signatures of the, of this plant. Here's, here's one. I'm, I'm spinning this plate. I don't want uh, my partner to, to do, to do the dishes because every time they do them, they put them away in the wrong spot. I don't want uh, the, <laughs> I don't want my partner to take their kid to the PTA meeting because I want to make sure that, you know, that, that they talk to the teacher about the thing, all these plates. So we're spending, somebody's spending all these plates. And so Blue Vervain says, look, it's okay. It's not, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with somebody who has that idealistic type. It's just like, let's focus on moving ahead and moving forward. It has a very, very bitter flavor. And the flavor of bitterness brings us back into our body. It stimulates all of our stuff that's going on in our periphery back into rest and digest parasympathetic mode. And it's a magical plant too. It's very tall and erect. And the way that it grows is that it has a long, long stem without much going on. And then once it gets to the flower, it's just like a whole bunch. So that's to, that's to say like, it has, there's a lot of gears up here, but they're not engaged and they're not, they're not on the road. We don't have our ankle on the road. So that's one. And that brings to mind also um, when starting something, it's really nice to have the rep receptivity to other people for criticism, right? And so that that's another thing that we might be able to stop stop ourselves from from progressing forward. And so uh, some plants that come to mind for that might be just like softening plants, like marshmallow or Solomon seal. And um, another one, another thing that comes to mind too is just scaling, scaling your stuff. So. Eileen writes a book. Well, how I want to write a book. I really do. I'm starting. I'm, I'm writing a book. What am I doing? I'm just chipping away. I'm just uh, put some. I put something in. I have a, a a thing that I'm going to accomplish that day, and I try to get it done that day. And if it doesn't get done that day, it gets done the next day. But it's it's instead of this huge vision, this huge practice, this huge business, this all the stuff that I want to do. It's just little goal after little goal after little goal. And then when you scale it, you don't have to worry about debt. You don't have to worry about getting ahead of yourself in a, in a way that you're not prepared for. You are laying the foundations upon more and more so that you have a strong foundation to stand on. And when it's time to for that, for that draft to fall over as it will, you still have the foundations at the bottom to put it back up again. And that's a really, really, really important part of getting started. And so for me and the Aries too, the Aries love this because they love to start things. And, um, but they're not always, they're not always at the finish line. Are they? <laughs> so, uh, that's the, oh, oh, here's one more borage, borage for courage is what I say. Borage for courage. So show your courage, be courageous. And this is a plant that I love to work with as a flower essence because it has this beautiful vibratory aspect that helps with our courage and just a drop of borage flower essence really helps you feel like you can face things, um, in, in, in your, your heart centered, like what, what you want to follow with your heart that actually you might be afraid, afraid to do. And then borage as like a medicinal herb, or, you know, if you want to cook with it, it's a, it's a edible culinary herb too. It's really supportive of your adrenals. And so if you're getting started in something, let's say you're going to grad school or you're uh, writing a new book or something like that, this, these types of things tax you in other departments of your life. And so sometimes you might feel like you're getting a little burnt out and it's really nice to set up yourself for uh, the long run with, you know, herbs that will help with, you know, your endocrine system and, and so on. So a couple ideas. That's a cool question. Yeah. I also noticed that too with, uh, with Aries people going on right now. Lots of, where do I go? Stuckness. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's the biggest thing that I say that I treat with biofield tuning is stuckness. You know, if I have to boil it down, or like, what is the one thing that everybody who comes in to see me suffering from? <laughs> and that's that they're stuck in some way. And they're stuck inside their own wiring, basically. And I think that biofield tuning is a great tool for helping people to get unstuck. I remember when I used to be in clinic all day, you know, I'd come home at the end of the day and I'd feel like a tow truck driver. <laughs> like I pulled people out of ditches all day, <laughs> help them get their rubber on the road. Um, because a lot of this looping, when you, you, you know, you lay down all your wires in these loops, and then even if you want to do something different, you're just moving along those loops. 
And the cool thing is that we can come with an attuning fork and like grab the loop and like <laughs> unloop it and wire you straight so that all of a sudden now, you know, we've given you better pathways. So if you combine, you know, some borage and <laughs> some of these other things with tuning, uh, that can take you a long way. You know, I also, there's one other thing that, that I also thought of, and that is um, there's a Japanese term called Kaizen. I don't know if anybody's heard of it, but it's basically about doing things in small steps. Um, back in the days of Nightingale Conan and their CD and tape box sets of personal growth programs, they used to send out um, promotional letters. And I got one one day and on the, the cover of the envelope, it said, is your thinking too big causing you to fail? And, and I, you know, I'm a big thinker. And there was a long time there where I was stuck before I started getting tuned, honestly. And I was stuck not being able to go anywhere, not having the money, not having the means, not have seeing the way through, um, but also dreaming really big. And I found that question so compelling that I left the unopened envelope on my bedside table for like a week and just kept asking myself that question, is your thinking too big causing you to fail? And that was a really big turning point for me, actually, because I, I think a lot of times people... They, they want to get right to the thing, you know, <laughs> and, and there's a lot of small steps involved that, that might feel tedious or whatever. And people want to make a quantum leap, you know, <laughs> into a different reality. And uh, most of the time that doesn't happen. You know, it is these small sort of switchbacky kind of rocky, narrow path <laughs> that you, you have to walk on. Uh, in order to do the things that, that you want to do. And there's often places that are scary and require courage. You know, there's um, actually, Chance, have you done any research into the symbolism involved in this April 8th eclipse? Have you uh, looked into that at all? Yeah, not specifically symbolism, but I well, am actually, I'm in the path of totality out here. And the last big eclipse that crossed this path was in August of 2017. And I, I've told this story a bunch of times, so I'll just say it briefly. On the day of that eclipse, I saw beach ball sized white orbs come out of the ground like they're passing through the matter and fly around in the sky 15 feet above my head with two other witnesses present. You know, we're stone cold sober. And uh, then later that day, the eclipse happened. So I'm Wow. Kind of, I'm like going to be looking over my shoulder every direction <laughs> on that day. the orbs. Wow, that? that's really wild. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I've never seen anything like it. But it, I don't know what it was, but they were about this big. There was one uh, that came up and then was kind of floating around. And then a couple more came up and they like, it was like one of those shell games where they're switching places. And then they became one orb and then they split up again into multiple and then flew away off behind the trees. The whole thing was over in about a minute, but it was gnarly. Did you take any pictures? Oh no. It's like, <laughs> it was, it was happening so quick and it, it, we were just, Whoa, what's that? And then it was over, you know? Wow. That's really wild. Well, I'm going to be looking for those orbs on the next eclipse. Then. <laughs> Are you going to be I'm, around the path of totality? If that's I am. Be, uh... I'm going to be back at Confluence where I tuned during the last eclipse in October in the, the lunar eclipse. Uh, what's interesting is that Sovereignty Ranch, where Confluence is happening, is 33 miles from the 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 square center of the October eclipse and now this April eclipse. And where they cross in Texas, uh, we're almost, we're very close to dead center of that. And I will be tuning during the eclipse. Um, but but the, the theme, what I, what I wanted to mention about this, um, as I've dug into understanding some of the stuff that's going on, there's some very interesting, um, odd things. Like um, when it comes into Texas, it, it goes over a, t a city called Jonah that's near Austin. And then um, in the path of totality, there's only actually two Ninevehs, but there's there's seven total Ninevehs that are uh, either in or close to the path of the eclipse. Okay, and, so last um, one in 2017, there were like that many Salem's. Salem's, exactly. There were that. There were seven Salem's. Well, actually, there were two that were totally in totality, and then there were five that were close. 
right? And and uh, and so yeah, so you got the Salem. Salem means peace. Um, and and there, there's a lot here. I don't want to go into all that because I am actually doing a Sonic Sunday on Easter, and I'm going to do a presentation on all of these different things. Uh, but the story, I, it made me go look up the story of Jonah because I didn't I didn't know the story of Jonah. And it's actually kind of a cool story. So um, so Nineveh was uh, like Babylon or like the United States now. You know, everybody had like gone and become debauched and, um, you know, not following God and not being well behaved. And so God says to Jonah, he said, Jonah, I want you to go into Nineveh and I want you to preach to people and I want you to get them to repent. And Jonah was like, um, no, I'm not doing that. And he gets on a boat with some of his buddies and they go out to sea. But then they hit all of these storms and they're like, what the heck is going on? And Jonah's like, actually, it's me. God asked me to go preach in Nineveh and I didn't want to. And so now all these storms are happening. And so his buddies are like, Jonah, what the heck? And they threw him off the boat. And then he gets swallowed by the whale. And he's in the belly of the whale for three days. And then the whale brings him back to Nineveh three days later and spits him up on the shore. And so Jonah's like, okay, God, I, I got it. And so he goes into Nineveh and, and he starts preaching to people. But it just so happens that there was a full solar eclipse, a total solar eclipse on this day that the whale spit him up. And so Jonah's like, dude, we got to repent to God. And then this eclipse happened. They're like, oh, we better listen to Jonah. And so th the city did. It repented. And, and went back to God and we're, we're like, OK, we're going to get in the straight and narrow and, you know, and, and, and honor God. And, and God spared them from destruction because that was the threat. Like, if you don't get your act together and get back with me. And, uh, and so the, this eclipse is so interesting. And then it's Jonah, Nineveh, Nineveh, Nineveh. And, you know, what is the invitation to our sinful nation but to repent and to come back to God. And so I started thinking about that in the times that, you know, God asked me to bring tuning forks out in the world. And I was like, hell no, I'm not going to be the tuning fork lady. I was like, there's no way I'm doing that. And I went through a whole bunch of resistance um, before I finally admitted that it was a good idea and agreed to do it. But I put a lot of energy into resisting it. And then God asked me to do these Sonic Sunday transmissions. I was like, I'm not giving up my Sundays to do free tune-ups for people. Like, no. <laughs> but, then, but then I realized, you know, then I was like, oh, you're right. It's a good idea. I should do it, right? And so, so when I was looking and, and understanding, like, all of the symbolism in this clip, because it's wide and deep, and it just keeps going on and on and on. It's like, how is this even possible? Um I was like, oh, my God, like I had my own experience of repentance where I was like, God is so great and life is so amazing. And when I get asked to do something like I, I, I have to stop giving a hard time <laughs> like, and I really repented. I was like, I'm not going to argue anymore. I'm going to like do what you tell me because they're always the right thing. It's always the right thing. Right. So. Um, so that's going to be my talk is like what my take is on the idea of repentance, what, what that really means. Uh, for us and then just share all of these mind-blowing like synchronicities and symbols that are present for this event that's coming up that's beautiful uh, jenny my wife she says i still can't get over here in whale songs sped up they sound like bird songs bird songs slow down sound like whale songs but to throw a little more light on the jonah story and the redemption aspect of it it's basically a type of the redemption savior uh, mythos. It's an earlier version of it. Like Jonah in Hebrew is a word that means dove, but it's also philologically the same as the word yoni, which I find interesting. So wow. in, in more ancient versions of the system, uh, there's goddesses like Semiramis or Io or even Helen, like Helen of Troy, who's basically like a, a goddess figure in the way that she's mythologized. And these goddess figures or the, the Yoni power would be uh, crucified too. Like they're a crucified savior as well. And when they would, would die, they would their spirit would turn into a dove and fly away. And we know like the association of the dove with Jesus as well when he gets baptized by uh, Yoni the Baptist. I mean, Yohannes the Baptist. <laughs> in the water uh jonah and the whale that's three days and three nights 
And it's interesting, like, like that's Jesus in the, you know, in the tomb, it's a similar concept. It's interesting how this is happening on around the time of uh, the like spring equinox Easter season, you know, like the, the redemption thread does seem to be there and how these eclipses are making a cross <laughs> or like the, the two eclipses are making a cross that share some of these concepts. So those are a few of my thoughts, but maybe, maybe we're meant to be uh, to like turning our attention to exactly what you're talking about at this time, like more of us feeling the call and then through inspired um, reflections like yourself who have uh, a bigger pulpit or soapbox to point our attention this way of like, what is, what is it you're being called to do? You know, I'm definitely getting some calls right now <laughs> in my life and uh, very excited about some of that stuff and people will hear about it later on, but there, you, you just gotta, there's like, there's the, my way is the right way. And that's totally allowed. And then while you're on that is where you're going to get <laughs> the clues of like, but this is uh, the beat, the bigger, the bigger call from the heavens or whatever you want to say, like, <laughs> I'm going to just leave it there for now. Yeah. I'm going to give it to Kyle. Sorry. I was muted there. Yeah. I was just thinking, um, in, uh, the salts of salvation book by Frank Carey and Inez, um, Perez, I can't remember. I'm sorry. The second author, I forget, but they talk about in the Pisces cell salt that the, that really the true cause of all disease is sin and the, the lack of repentance. Like that's, that's it. So, um, <laughs> And, you know, they set, they set it up so nicely so that, you know, when you when you get to that part, it's not such a big, you know, religious trigger for for the reader um, and, and how it relates to um, biochemistry as well. I think that's really interesting. So, yeah, I've, I kind of I mean, in, in, in a macrocosmic way, again, not just with the sin of, you know, Babylon and how it's presented and the debauchery, but also. Um, sin, which means off the target. So here we are living in a society that is off the target of nature, things that, you know, that you, that were sold at the grocery store, for example, you know, and, and that we, you know, like people like me, I still consume. Um, and, you know, I try always to be better with, you know, local stuff, but then again, I'm drinking lemon water and there's no lemons in Wisconsin, you know? So that might even, even though it's organic, you know, uh, <laughs> it still might be off the target because it's off of nature. And then having to uh, come to terms with that and um, come to terms with the health of my body and um, find a little bit of, um, I don't know, reconciliation for that. Uh, all of that stuff, I think, is is charged up in what's, what's ahead with this um, pause, if you will, of the light. You know, that's what it is. It's a pause of the light. And it's kind of like, uh, you know, if you're watching a movie that's streaming and all of a sudden it just pauses for a minute, you're like, oh, what's going on? Is the internet okay? Um, <laughs> or if your lights go out, you look and see if, the, if your neighbor's lights have went out or something like that. So all, so that's what, I, that's what I think about all of it is that let's take it as a pause, a moment of reflection um, and reflect individually, reflect on our individual choices, reflect on um, and the choices that we make for, you know, how, how things are govern society at large. And um, that's what I'll be doing. I'm not going to be anywhere near the eclipse. I'm going to be out of the pathway, but I've also uh, decided, I don't know, even if I was, I don't know if I'd want to be. I'm not really, I don't have, I don't have a, a, a fear of it. I just, I'm just like, I think I'm just going to take the day to fast and pause and really uh, connect to what, what it might mean, you know, uh, as a, as a, a moment in time and uh, make it memorable for myself. That's all. Yeah. I think that the confluence sounds great. I have a really good friend from my town. His name is BJ Fisher. Eileen, do you know BJ? He's a, he's the guitar I'm, player. Yeah, no, I know. Uh, I think I met, was BJ at the last one? Was he yeah. there? Yeah. Yeah. I met him yeah, there. He's going to be there and super cool. Super good energy. And I was, I was thinking he invited me. We should go, we should bend. And, um, so anyway, I, I think it's going to be an awesome time and it sounds really, really fun. The mud pit, 
uh, Alec is a legend, and yeah, I think it's I think it's a, a, a going to be a very memorable eclipse, no, no matter what you're doing. Yeah, well, we had a great time last year at, at our first one. It's a it's a fantastic venue. It's so cool to be on the ranch there. Uh, it's great people. Um, it's great food, you know, music, like all the things that you want. Uh, but then we got music and sky coming up. And Chance, are you, you going to be in music and sky this year? I have uh, too many things going on around here. I know, I know. They're they're good reasons, but I'm keeping <laughs> to myself for now. I want to actually weave a little bit more on this darkening of the light, the eclipse, the pause moment. I really like the uh, thinking about how when the sun disappears in a time when you would normally expect it to be there, it's sort of like giving you the opportunity to take a step back and consider hey, it's more than just me going on here. The light of this world is also responsible for my ability to even exist. So getting, you know, taking a moment to reflect like, well, what is the higher will for me in this lifetime? I've actually got some notes on this because I was thinking about the very notion, uh, I don't know, back in January or something, but in Islamic theology, they have an idea that only God knows a man's heart or his true intentions. And it's typically understood by Westerners to mean that you can't know another person's true intentions. And so be cautious of duplicity when you're dealing with other people. That might be true, but <laughs> what, you know, that might also be why Muslims will follow statements with of what, of their own intent with, if Allah wills it, it's like they're covering their bases <laughs> or deflate, you know, deflating the possible disappointment if their goals do not manifest. And I don't think that's a bad idea, really. Uh, <laughs> so the Arabic word in the Quran that is translated to mean intention is niya. And in the Quran, it says, there is no blame on you for what you do by mistake, but only for what you do intentionally. And Allah is all forgiving and most merciful. That's from Al Azab chapter 33, verse 5. So, Islamic people take the idea so seriously that one's niyah, I don't know if I'm saying that right, or their intention is the most important requirement before their ritual prayer. This is the internal prayer spoken from the heart to harmonize the audible utterance. In Arabic, the literal definition of niyah, niyah <laughs> is the pit of a date or a fruit kernel or a stone or the source from which something emerges or grows. It's akin to the idea of a nucleus or a center, or in other words, it's like the dye from which something is shaped or cast. Your deepest self, and it's the source from which you emanate, is your intention or your niya. If you have faith that your life is not created out of random chaos, that there's a divine plan or play at work, and that at the center of it uh, is your free will, to choose your thoughts, behaviors, and actions, you may also realize that throughout your life, your own intentions may not have always been clear. That certain actions have had unexpected results goes without saying that sometimes we realize our subconscious programming is playing out through our behavior in unexpected ways is an important realization for anyone on a path of self-realization. It's logically acceptable to infer that before or beyond this particular life, the touchstone events in a life story may have been chosen by the soul who incarnates to experience those events, especially the harder or darker experiences. You know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So the healthy individual knows no regret because even the least enjoyable parts of their path were just as crucial to their becoming who they are as were the fun and easy parts. And so, so applied to the big picture, one really doesn't always know their own deepest, truest intentions, especially in the mistakes we all make. But God, or our source, our highest aspect of self, does know our intention. And I think this is the meaning of the phrase, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will. I don't necessarily think that that means what a lot of truthers would say, that it's like a satanic interpretation uh, that do what you want with no regard for the consequences incurred for others. I think it means that the closer you get to discovering your own deepest, truest intentions, through that process of messy creation, the closer you get to finding God within yourself. God knows your intentions better than you, but if you know God, you'll know your intentions and vice versa. That's totally the message that's in the uh, the never ending story where Bastion gets into Fantasia after 
you know, he's reading the book, but then he actually falls into it. And while he's there, he's like a godlike being who whatever he wishes for comes true. But when he wishes for things that aren't really in alignment with his true will and his true self, he forgets, he loses memories of who he is and where he came from to the point where he becomes like all powerful, but in a misaligned way and loses almost all his memory of where he came from. So in the world that we're in, it's like all your wishes, this is the place where wishes come true. And we, we're here for the experience of what that's like. To, and it's slowed down in a merciful way so that you don't just have things pop up the second you think about them, but with directed intention and attention and, and actions. I really like that you brought up that Kaizen or Kaizen process of small daily practice building up. It's cumulative. I've done so many things that were big things that I did five minutes or 10 or 15 minutes a day. <laughs> And it adds up to something huge. So, you know, that's so there. Some of that was like some writing I did on the, on this idea a while back, but there is something magical about that messy creative process, exercising your will in the world while always being mindful of how am I, am I getting closer or further away from God's will for me? Like if you're just going through the motions and watching TV and clocking into a job you don't like, this whole process doesn't even really engage. So that's why you have to st start doing the messy, creative, uh, you know, side hustle, entrepreneur, uh, or creative practice or whatever version of that is calling to you so that you can figure out if that's even the one that it was calling to you in the first place. <laughs> it might have actually just been a stepping stone to something else that you couldn't even imagine until you laid some of those foundations. And the, so the closer you get to your true will, the closer you get to knowing God's will for you, which is like for Eileen, I think that's why you're getting it on the phone, <laughs> like do this, do a Sunday sermon. Cause you've been uh, engaging this process for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, de definitely. I mean, I, I started following my own inner guidance from a very early age that, you know, I don't, I have always been able to discern it. And I think some people have so much noise in their head that they can't necessarily discern what is clear, true guidance and you know, what should be heeded. Um, but, you know, I, one of the phrases that I like to play around with is this idea that we have free won't as opposed to free will, because that's where it tends to show up more is when we exercise it in the won't. God's like, do the Sunday service. I'm like, I won't. <laughs> I'm exercising my ability to resist that guidance. Right. And, and I, I think that that's a sort of a more accurate and useful way to depict the concept of free will is around because everybody understands free will. <laughs> that's that's perfect. Hey, I, I'm wondering if uh, if I could shift for a second to um, talking about the biofield anatomy of plants. That's all. Can right I, I, I want to do that. I'm just going to take a quick second. This seems like since we're switching gears and give some thanks. First of all, polymath thing, Canadian dollars. Appreciate your super chat, buddy. And Marty leads of the Gnostic Academy. Appreciate that super chat. Always coming in with a nice generous super chat. And then Braden over on the Rockman side, which is a great way to super chat because they don't take a 30% cut. He gave a generous generous big one and he says happy birthday brother get yourself a cool rock i most definitely will so just wanted to give thanks to those super chats and make sure they're acknowledged and witnessed but yeah biofield of plants so let's let's open that up uh, yeah i think it was really funny because the uh when eileen was talking about 33 miles away from uh wherever in texas is marty leeds popped up and i was like oh that's that's hilarious that's all you have to do um <laughs> So I'm, I'm a little curious about, uh, I'm just m more than curious. I'm like super duper duper fascinated and interested. Uh, ever since you've proposed uh, talking about that, you've, I first heard you talking about it on Alpha Vedic. I heard you talking about it with our friend Topher. Um, tuning plants, the story that you mentioned about tuning a, a maple tree in front of your house and bringing some vitality back to it. I don't know if it was a maple tree, either, if I'm just... I have, it was a maple, maple tree. I have a maple tree in front of my house that needs tuning too. It's got some <laughs> blotches and stuff. So yeah. And so <laughs> I'm a tuning plant guy and I'm also very tuned into plants. Like I hear plants. Um, I get um, messages from plants beyond the audit 
auditory sense. Just like, you know, when you're, when you're tuning, you're, you're actually picking up an audible sound, but there's much, there's like a lot of packet of information with that that comes. Ky you know? Kyle is a plant messenger. Literally, he has jingles. He sings jingles that are from a certain plant so you can understand what it is that they're here for. <laughs> like commercials. Um, they're so fun. <laughs> they are really fun. Yeah, my uh, my one or two-year-old son, every night I have to rock him to sleep if, if uh, his mom can't get him to sleep. So we've been singing this song for almost a year now that I came up with it because it's an Aries plant and it's about stinging nettle. And now he sings along with me. So if you don't mind, I'll sing it. It goes. Um, it's a, It's about there's a play on words with because he's a half italian boy so one of his his mother's tongue is is italian so when he gets hit, hurt he goes ay 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 so it starts out like this i i i know a plant that makes my body feel green like a chicken in spring i i identified on a moonless night it was quite a friendly sting in a soup in a pesto, in a tea kettle, stinging nettle. And we just do that over and over and over again, all night long for the last year. It's really fun. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I feel like, you know, the, when, I'm, when I'm in the, the field, um, I get these songs. They're catchy songs. And, and, and uh, maybe I'm some sort of like, Midwestern um, punk rock curandero or something, <laughs> but I get, I'm like, oh, who's you, song? You've got the you're fairy touched. This is the guy that will be walking through the woods and and all of a sudden realize I need to put on my clothes backwards for the fairies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a definitely a remedy for for if the fairies are messing with you. If you can't find your keys or if your glasses are somewhere, just try putting your clothes on backwards and say a few things backwards. It makes them laugh, and then they usually you know, leave them in your refrigerator or wherever. Um, that's the, that's the remedy. But, uh, where, I, where I was going with this is, um, is I, I really, really appreciate learning about plants through all the different ways. And I feel like they are the teachers to me. And so, uh, when you were talking about tuning the plants, I was like, Oh, duh. Like how, how could I have not have thought of that? Like, that seems very, very obvious to me. And maybe it's because I'm already, I feel like I'm tuned in in some ways. So, I'm, I'm interested if you've explored uh, the, the biofield anatomy as it pertains to like the, I don't know, the anthroposophical model, maybe outlined by like mystics like uh, Goethe and who, who I call Jeff and um, Stein, Rudolf Steiner. And um, in, in that this model pr presents plants that have like a, a clear polarity to human form, right? So like where there's the roots, they take hold of um, what they're perceiving in the environment from the earth realm. And they are quite selective about the minerals that they bring up. And, um, and so the roots have a relationship to the thinking qualities that we have being outside in our environment. So roots have a relationship to our animal mind, our animal bodies as well, being a, of the world. Uh, the leaves have a representation to rhythm, to breath. Uh, they're related to the water element. Um, and just like our own, just like our own uh, carbonness as it deconstructs in our body and it leaves our uh, ourself through uh, inver inversely proportionated tree <laughs> out into the world, and then it is uh, absorbed by that uh, inversely proportionated tree out there if, by the carbon and gives us oxygen. And there's this great exchange, and so the leaves have that relationship with the rhythm, the chest, the movement of the heart. Uh, the the rhythm of our of our spine, and um, then moving up we have the the fruit and the, the sorry the flower first, which is the air element and uh, has a lot more to do with like the me metabolism and reproductive system and the and the the, the fruit as well and the fire element, baked by the sun and so on, um, and uh, so I'm just wondering in in your experience with tuning um, if you've noticed uh, anything about the some of these models how they might represent uh that fractality with a human being if you found uh what you found i guess when, in your exploration of of the tuning of the plants and um how it expresses how it's perceived in in the fork is it um different for you and i have i have uh, some experience too i would love to share my notes too but go ahead 
I can't say that the times when I've tuned things other than humans, uh, pets, plants, that I've had any kind of curiosity about the biofield anatomy, honestly, about what their biofield anatomy might be. Um, I always come in with, with plants and, and nature and uh, animals just curious about what the signal is telling me, you know, which is kind of a, in a general way, I'll just approach it and I'll be curious more about what's coming through with the signal uh, in that particular plane of approach. But I, it, it's honestly never occurred to me to explore the biofield of a house plant and discover it, if different areas are holding different information or let me chime stories. in one thing, you know, with, with humans, there's a clear front and back plants, not so much, you know? So like, I wonder if it's really not, uh, if it's an apples to oranges thing. Yeah. Well, it's true, right? Cause the humans, you've got a front a back, a left or right, you know, you got the sides of the head and whereas a plant is, it is a very different thing. It's like, what is all of that? Um, but even with animals, you could potentially, but I just don't, I guess I've never felt like it was necessary to explore and understand that in order to create a successful adjustment with whoever I'm working on. Right. So, you know, I tend to do things by necessity. Like if, if it's necessary for me to do something in a particular way, I'll figure out how to do it. But if it's not necessary, I will, I just won't. Right. I'm a big shortcut taker. It's why I've gotten so much done in my life. I'm like, oh, I can eliminate that step, eliminate that step, eliminate that step. So, um, but, but then it's not my primary wheelhouse. Like for someone like you, Kyle, where plants are your primary wheelhouse, right? I can see where you would be drawn deeper into different facets of exploration with that. So I'm curious what you discovered. And one thing I catch with people a lot is just at the opening or using, you know, I think a lot of biofield tuners will do pendulums. I'm more of like a dowsing rods guy myself, but just in that opening scan, a lot of times I will get the full sense of what the theme of this tuning is going to be and the, <laughs> you know, and then we're just looking for that theme in the other areas of the specifics of the biofield, psychologizing it. Plants probably aren't psychologizing the, you know, their, their reality to that degree. But I wonder with like the earth star and the sun star, uh, and the central axis, if that might be one area where there's overlap between plants and humans that they tend to have at least that like column experience going on. And maybe something has gone on to knock that out of whack. <laughs> Again, back to the, like a theme of a whole tuning. I, I think the, the party trick of just checking out their earth star and sun star and then telling them, okay, this is how you operate. This is your guiding principles. This is uh, <laughs> this is the way that you act. <laughs> like you can, you get so much just out of looking at that alignment. If, something is off or, or shorter, too close or all of the above. So maybe that's, maybe that's one axis of uh, analysis that could be brought in with plants. It's my two cents. Yeah, wow. I, so I was in a, I was in the forest today. I was in this old growth forest. that's not far from my house that I love to go to. And um, so in, it's like old growth. There's like really beautiful species that are kind of rare in there of, flowers and plants and there's a cemetery in the middle and it's just like lots of energy <laughs> there's a lot of energy in this place and so i was just i was like i'm gonna go around and i'm there's this plant or a tree it's a cottonwood tree that i that everyone that knows this forest identifies as grandfather tree like this sucker is like seven feet in diameter um and it is just massive 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 tree and so and it's in the middle so it's kind of like that um, uh, avatar tree, you know, it's like it feel you really feel like it's got a, it's got a connection and it's got its pulse on its, its roots on the pulse of everything. And so I was like, I want to I want to go hang out with that tree and see what that's like, because um, I was we're, we're my son and I were tuning around other trees. And that was another thing, too. I was like, I'm going to hand him the fork. He's really good at just playing around. And I'm just it's actually he's pretty close to <laughs> nature and source right now. So. Maybe I'll learn a thing or two about how he's like uh, approaching them and I'll take that into account. 
but anyway, when we're when we're hanging out by this uh, grandfather tree, I was like, where do I start? Where's the where's the the barrier? So I started like 25 feet away, and I just moved my fork about six inches, and I was like, and it was like, there it is. <laughs> I was like, come on, really? Uh, could it be? You know, did I really just pick the right place, or is it just is it just like you know ap appearing that way because that's what it wanted to show me? And so that's the kind of information that we were that I was feeling throughout this uh, um, session, I guess I would I would call it. And I really spent a lot of time there. Um, I could feel distinct patterns of um, the same the same type of feeling that I get when uh, there's a loss from a parent or from a loved one in somebody's biofield in that distance of 25 feet, like as if another tree fell, fell down. I really felt that. And I also felt, um, this was really interesting too. I'm using, uh, the, the 140 and, um, and I switched out to the 528 and when I pulled out the 528, I could not hear it at all. It just like ting, ting. It was like, I was like, what's going on here? Is it, is it sucking up this energy? Is it, it's just not allowing it at all. It was almost like the, the forest did not like it, or it wasn't, there wasn't a resistance to it. It was just like, it just pulled it up. It was like a vacuum. So I found that really interesting. And, um, and yeah, so I'm playing with house plants because I have access to the roots. Like I can like tune the root, you know, in the pot and then I can go up to the top and the, and the trunk and everything like that. So I am try trying to feel like the, like I was describing that, like, um, theosophical model of the, the thinking quality of the plant. And uh, according to, you know, like the, the models of Steiner and things like that, um, when a plant is, when it's uh, in, the, in the summertime, when it's blooming, that is like the soul leaving its thinking quality. So it's like out there. And when our soul is leaving our thinking quality, we call that sleep. We call that dreaming. And then the soul comes back and the spirit's always there, but the, the soul comes back, that animated lights on aspect comes when we wake up. And so it is pretty interesting to think that, you know, we might, we, we might get a different reading in the, in the summertime, which is when all the, all the trees are technically dreaming in this, you know, way of thinking about it. And uh, as from the winter time, which is when they're like really communicating on a, on a more animalistic nature of of uh, through the roots and everything like that so i don't know i'm just breaking the ice on it i really feel it's it's extremely exciting it's really fun especially because i enjoy um you know harvesting plants i work, harvest plants for medicine and there'll be times clearly when i'm around a plant and i get uh you know just like you know this the same way that uh, god might speak to me i call it the holy ghost where the plant is like take me for this person. And I, and I'm like, Oh, wow. Or it'll be like, no way, <laughs> no way. Uh, leave me alone. And I don't know why, maybe there's pesticides, maybe there's something, maybe there's a, and it's, and sometimes it's just like, Hey, just go up the hill. There's, you know, there's our buddy up there and there's a huge patch. And so that's another thing too, is this, uh, uh, being in tune with those, that transmission, of the Holy ghost, I guess you could say. And, uh, and, regretting it when I'm not listening, you know, when I'm resisting, when I, when I have the free won't, uh, there's times when it really does come back to bite me. Um, and, uh, and so that's something that I feel, you know, I, I can access without a tuning fork, but I'm really interested in the potential of bringing my tuning forks along for the, for the foray, just to see, just to see what else is bringing in there. And, uh, I haven't had this uh, hair brain idea in the growing season yet. So here we go. That's something I'm, that's something I'm going for. It's right. So much to explore. I mean, that, that is, it's like going out in the winter, like how does it sound and feel and what's going on here in the winter, the spring, the summer, the fall. I mean, there's so much to discover. There's just so, so, so much to discover and to listen to and to interact with. And, and I really find that the tuning forks, um, help make anybody into a plant whisperer or a pet whisperer. I mean, I can, the moment that I tune into a plant or I tune into a pet, I immediately have a conversation going. Like there is communi understandable communication flow that is happening. And, uh, and, and I think anybody can do that. I really do. I think it's just a matter of quieting your mind 
um, because this is happening. When we know that plants uh, communicate, right? It's it's. Uh, somebody sent me something recently, and they said that plants actually emit pretty high decibels, but somehow in a range that we don't hear. And uh, I had an experience with my own house plants, just hearing them, not not tuning them, but. Um, I had a bunch of aloe plants that had kind of multiplied and spider plants that had multiplied and they were all over my, my kitchen counter. And so I decided to separate them because my aloe plants were turning into spider plants. They were getting long and skinny instead of plump. And so I decided that they are having too much influence from the spider plants. So I took all the spider plants out and I put them in a different room except for one, which I left <clears throat> on a different table in there. So I was getting ready to leave for on a three week trip and I walked past that spider plant and it was screaming at me <laughs> that it wanted to go in the room with the other spider plants that I had left the only spider plant in there with all those aloes and it knew that I was leaving and boy did it work to get my attention and to communicate clearly to me to please move it into the other room. I mean, I was walking past it. I'm like, whoa, okay. <laughs> like, right. As they definitely do, they're tuned into us and they are communicating. And so the tuning forks just kind of create a, a translator almost that lets you hear and understand them. The plants emitting sound when stressed is a, is proven by, the science trademark as well. Yeah. It's just like humans that when we're undergoing hard time or we're holding a lot of dissonance or a lot of fear or we're just damaged, we leak sound or we leak lights. It's, it's both actually. I mean, yeah. sound and light are the same thing on a different part of the spectrum, but that's a, you know, that's something very, very similar between the two types of uh, organism. But Kyle, I wanted to know, are you cool with me playing the Instagram video you made today in the forest with Davide? It's yes, just a minute yeah, that'd, that'd be fun. That'd be fun. I think everybody would like this. Okay, it's just a minute. All right, Kyle and Davide reporting from the woods. We are tuning the trees. We are learning the biofield of the forest. Here, let's listen to this tree. Let's listen to this, this beech tree right here. What does it sound like? No, this one over here. Da -da. What does that beech tree sound like? Tonight on Vibrant on the Interverse channel on YouTube. Yeah, I just wanted to get Davide tuning because, <laughs> you know, you got him learning young. He's going to be a master. And boy, is that kid big for a two year old. Yeah, he's really big. He's, it's, it's really funny. He is, it's really fun how, uh, you know, he's just like, it's going to be natural for him to go up to, the, not only does he go up to the, every tree and hug it, he goes up to every tree, takes his hat off. As, as like a as like a sign of reverence. I didn't teach him that. He hugs it and he's like, wait, my hat's on. And he takes it off like he's in church and he hugs it for like five seconds and then he kisses it. I, I taught him how to hug it because he was on the trail one day and I just wanted him to like pick up the pace. Come on. Hey, come over here and hug this tree. And so he like hurried up to hug the tree. And now it was just like he hugs every single tree. And not only that, if there's a root sticking out of the ground, he bends down and kisses the root. <laughs> oh, oh it's so sweet. So, yeah, I think he's going to be uh, really tuned into the aspects of nature, too. I, oh, you know what? I was just thinking, too, Chance, the, um, just to double back on what you were saying, too. There's a, there's a book called The God, is it the Secret Life of Plants and uh, Researcher. Cleve Baxter in the seventies. And I think he's the one that basically came up with, he, he hooked up to, he was um, uh, one of those guys that does lie detector test, you know, like for Maury Povich show or whatever, but he's doing it for the, he's doing it for the uh, law enforcement and the plant in the room is like, uh, they, they, they hooked it up to the plant in the room and it made it started making signals. And he started, uh, it basically started this whole movement that like the plants have this, they're emitting the same, stuff that we are, electromagnetism, uh, right? And um, so not only were the plants able to, you know, have a, a higher frequency when they're stressed, but they were able to identify, uh, they set up like experiments with like <laughs> plant murderers where they would have like, you know, a, a, a group of people draw straws and then, you know, nobody knew who it was. And then they, one person that had the shorter straw would go into a room and like hack up a, a piece of 
a tree that was right next to another one, another house plant. And then one by one, they would bring the people in. And when the person that was the murderer of the tree came in, the plant was like, ah, do, 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 on the EKG or, or uh, whatever the lie detector test, I can't remember what it's called. Um, and uh, so it is, <laughs> I think that's really interesting. Uh, but also he was like, well, what about, I wonder if they, how they react at a distance. So he went on a, uh, like a conference or something like that. And he taught s far away where he had to take a plane ride and he had his, pl his plant hooked up back at the lab. And when he got back home, he saw, oh, there was a whole bunch of activity right here. What was going on at that? He checked his watch. That was when I was talking about the plant at the conference. He was like showing a slideshow about the plant and the plant was like, it was like wagging its tail. Like the dog knows when it's, its owner's coming home or whatever, right? And so he's like, well, this is going to be really fun. So he, went, he took, a, he took a, um, a notebook and he went to Times Square on New Year's Eve. And he just went, he's just like, I want to have the whole hustle and bustle and see if we could discern all of the activity of this plant. And so he almost got into a fight. He tried to like, he almost lost uh, on the subway. There's just like a lot of action, you know? And that was all uh, comported to what he would read in somebody as a, you know, EKG or gosh, what's the word? The lie detector specialist uh, as that, that he would read. It was all there. So the plant was reading this from a distance and that was, that was his house plan. And so just, uh, I mean, our house plants, they want our attention as Eileen was mentioning, and they react to how we feel even when we're not even locally in their proximity. And so that's just another, uh, if anybody wants to, you know, wonder about how does distance tuning work? Um, what is going on? <laughs> what is going on with this realm? It's it's just available at any time for anyone and anything. It seems, including the the house the the house plant that you know that I was uh, looking at right now that is just like wow, it's so intelligent, it's so beautiful, and um, I'm get I'm getting a, a, a like oh me vibe from this plant that I'm looking at right now. <laughs> So I think that's a, it's just a really fun book and it goes into a, a lot of different um, uh, the advancements of, of science in this matter. I think it was written in like the late seventies or eighties. So there's even more, even more to it now, but um, that's, it's a, it's a very fun study. And I think that bringing it all back to where we started here is that that can be accessed by just having a vocabulary from the tuning forks, which is what Eileen teaches and, and, your school and also in the book and i think it's just awesome there's just so it doesn't you don't have to have a fancy machine in a fancy laboratory you just have to have a tuning fork that rings true and that's yeah. it it's so true actually i i hooked up with a researcher who was continuing that research and i worked on a couple plants hooked up to a polygraph machine and that's where i discovered that that the language of vibration that plants feel fear in the same vibrational signature as humans so the, 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 is is you know plants can be afraid and the signal is the exact same as humans and i knew that animals were but it didn't even occur to me that plants spoke the same language but they do and so of course they sense what's going on with us because they understand our vi our vibes my wife them. she always was described like fear as a wobble and she's not even a tuner you know, but like, that's just the self-evident truth that fear has like this wobble quality to it. It's the, we trip when we're f in fear metaphorically, or sometimes literally because it throws us off balance with all of this like extra vibration. Yeah, for sure. In fact, it, and it also like depletes your gas mileage, right? Cause it's a double beat. So you're spending twice as much energy in any given moment when you're running fear or anxiety in your system. So, Speak. and it's not, you know, but it's also, um, and it can be really hidden. Actually, Chase, you've encountered fear, right? As a tuner, Kyle, have you encountered fear in, in, and know that, that feeling, right? It's very distinctive it, and it, you can really perceive it through the forks, but it was actually one of the last emotions that I figured out. Um, because like fear, uh, sadness was the first one that I identified. I was like, Oh, I, that's, there's sadness in that fork and anger and frustration and worry and all of these things. And, but I, I had been listening in and understanding the language of vibration for at least a couple of years before I finally 
before the frequency of fear finally sunk into my consciousness. And I was working on a woman who was very generously proportioned and everywhere I held the fork, it, it had this thing in it. And all of a sudden it dawned on me that that was fear. But I think it's very hard for us to perceive and understand emotions that we don't feel in ourselves. And I grew up as the youngest of six, like in a pack, basically in a kind of environment where if you show fear, you get attacked. And so I learned how to bury fear in myself to the point where I didn't feel it. Like I, I started traveling by myself when I was 16. I traveled around the world. Like I was never afraid of anybody, anything, anywhere. I never felt fear. I just never, ever felt fear. And because I didn't have an intimate understanding or recognition of it, it was pretty much the last major emotion that I identified in the biofield. But many students pick it up right away because it, it can be so obvious, but it was going on all those years, but I just didn't perceive or understand it because I didn't recognize it in myself. I'm kind of like you in that way, but I also had the neural pathway, you know, mind, mind tunnel that you'd already dug out. So <laughs> and informed me of what to listen for, for fear. And uh, Jenny wants to know, is there a sound one could make with the mouth or vocal cords to help transmute in a moment of fear? Mm, that's a really good question. I mean, I think that that might be different for everybody, right? It, I, I, that's the sort of thing uh, might depend on your age, your sex, your location. Um, it might be different in different moments for different people. But I would say that that the, it's the answer is inside of you. So the next time you're in a situation where you want to transmute fear, just, you know, what? it's just, sometimes it's as simple as just asking the question in that moment, right? To just have the, because a lot of times people get into things and they're like, I don't know what this is. I don't know what this is. And if you just stop and get quiet and go, what is this? <laughs> It'll drop in. It'll just come to you. So in that moment, ask that question, what sound can I make or what could I do here to transmute or alchemize this and see what drops in? You know, just trust that. Your body already wants to make a sound when you're in a moment of discomfort or like pain or, and fear is a kind of a type of psychic pain. So there, there's that, just see what wants to naturally come out and, and play with that. And I don't know how you could have a bad time if you spend enough moments consecutively making sounds like there's it's fun <laughs> or what, what i one thing that just always gets me in the zone is i hit my big my big giant fork but you can do this with regular forks too I hold it up in the air like thor and then i just ah uh, and i just let my voice match the frequency of the fork and uh there's, there's like the best feeling ever it immediately just pulls me into the present moment and the flow and the zone and all that you can do that with any fork or just with your voice. So you don't even have to necessarily have a fork for that. Uh, I had a question though. Another question. <laughs> this is one, you know, this is a personal question. Do you have any, or have you ever found that, or have other people reported to you that it's trickier for them to tune family members, the people who, or friends who they might have, like, you might hold a biased opinion about them already or, uh, the resistance that might come from someone that close to your personal orbit where like the potential for the, uh, the story corrections that might come up in the tuning to be things you've already, they've already heard from you or, uh, you know, how, how does that work? Or is that something your family has kind of caught and passed because they're so close to you and the work you've been doing for so long? Well, <clears throat> I think a lot of tuners find that it's challenging to tune their own offspring and mate, but not as challenging to tune their parents uh, and their siblings. Uh, right. My, my older son is literally the only person that I ever encountered that I could not successfully adjust. I, I've never, I would say I've never been a shocker. I couldn't balance <laughs> until I like encountered my son's right knee and, and I could not get it to move. You know, because I'm an extre extremely stubborn and willful person, and so is my husband, and it kind of got compounded in my son. And, it's kind of like uh, a law of the universe that mom can't overcome every challenge for baby. <laughs> baby true. has to do it. 
Yeah, I just, I, I couldn't get anywhere. And, um, you know, whereas I can meet a stranger, can walk in the office and I won't, 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 won't and that's easy. Um, but, you know, and also I'll never forget when I was working on my son, Quinn, when I discovered in the biofield anatomy, the mother and father spots, and I went into my son and I listened to the mother spot and I was like, oh, <laughs> like, that doesn't sound very good. <laughs> And that was before I started getting tuned. You know, I was in college full time. I mean, it was a very, it was a stressful time. <laughs> I, was like, I probably shouldn't be listening to this. And and because we're so entwined in the energy of our children, we're not objective. We're, you know, I, I pretty much figured out that I could do first aid on my kids. I could do first aid and, and they were receptive to that and we could get somewhere. Um, but as far as like getting into the other things you can get in with tuning, it's just, it does it just doesn't work very well. I mean, maybe there's people who, who have found exceptions to that. Uh, but I, I just would rather somebody else work on them. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of like surgeons doing surgery on their children. You know, I think that you might not want to be a surgeon doing something like that or on your partner, right? It's you rather have, it's just somebody else's job. I wonder if there's like a certain age where that occurs or that, that difficulty crops up, like, you know, bouncing it over to Kyle, you've got a little one. Is it something that you find you can, I mean, there's not a lot of psychologizing for a two-year-old, right? So maybe it's just more on the first day, got a boo-boo, this is gonna make you feel better. But have you tried much tuning on Davide or on your wife? I, when it comes to my wife, I feel like that is, that was one of the first things, the first people I've ever tuned was my wife. And I was like, man, I suck at this. <laughs> I cannot get, uh, and, and like, that's the other thing too, is that like, it just as the nature of a relationship and, you know, just the mantle of taking myself seriously as a man sometimes, and I want to fix things. And I really felt like um, maybe I had, you know, er early on in my tuning practice like I had really wanted to put that into there you know what I mean and so actually it was the the a really good lesson for me in hindsight because I started to realize that uh, this stuff doesn't work if you if you if you try anything you can't do it you can't do it if you're trying you have to be neutral you have to receive you just have to report what's going on the ladies and, don't want us to fix the thing all the time. Sometimes they just want us to listen to the thing. Exactly. Yeah. And so that was a, so after, after the first time I did it, I was just like, uh, I don't know if I can just, and it put, it set me off six months <laughs> behind, you know, I didn't pick it up again for six months. And then well, I'm I, glad I we're bringing this up then. So other people might not get deterred from the path by similar experience. Yep. And I did it again. The second time I did it, I was like, here's the, I, I really want to do this. This is something I feel like I've, I could really excel at. So I'm going to do it. You, you lay down in your bed. Uh, the, the, uh, you know, the baby's asleep. You're everybody's comfortable. I'll be down in the basement and I'm going to do my first remote tuning. And then we'll just talk on FaceTime on, on the iPhone. And I actually just muted it. And, you know, I actually felt like that was a huge breakthrough for me because I could, I was initiated into the mystery of, uh, biofield tuning without having to suffer my, um, the, when I, when I get self-conscious of the feedback that's locally in the room as a, as a new, you know, as a new practitioner, I'm like, Oh, what? they're like scratching their ear. Does that mean it's like, does that mean I'm doing it wrong? Um, <laughs> things like that. So this is why really I love remote tuning. Even when somebody's in the same town as me, I'm like, let's just do it remotely. There's a lot of advantages to it. And, uh, and tuning my son is such a joy. I feel like it is extremely healing to tune my fa my family. Like it's really, 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 really healing to me. Um, I, it, it, I become so aware of my own shadow and, um, and even with my mom too, when it, like another thing that started me off on my journey and I was like, okay, I'm doing this. So well, I'm not sure if I should do this. I don't know if I'm good. So I, so I, I'm doing a distant session with my mom and uh, I'm in the uh, the right side off of the paternal line right there, as Eileen has described. And so this is so I'm 
got the fork right there, solar plexus. I'm like, oh, I'm thinking to myself, if uh, this is probably where my grandpa is, if he's here. And as soon as I brought the fork in there, I could hear three knocks on the ceiling above me. I'm in the basement. And that was my son knocking three times on the, on the floor. And my son's name is Davide. He's named after my mom's dad, David. And as soon as I put my fork in there, it was like, tomp, tomp, tomp. And, uh, and I was like, kind of exp waiting for some sort of like thing to happen, a cue, a ghost, you know, but it was actually a living, <laughs> a living child, you know, and um, it was and I was like, blown away by that. And I was like, Okay, this is cool. I'm, I'm totally in. Uh, that was another uh, initiation into another mystery of it. And um, and and also just being being there with, um, you know, these particular ancestral rivers and just really hanging out in the in those fields of my of my mom. She's listening, by the way. She's a big fan of yours, Eileen. So hi, mom. And uh, <laughs> it's and and just getting a lot of feedback about my own ancestry and my own lineage and the things that I need to do here um, to break without passing karma on further. And that was all available for me. And so I, I really feel that reflected back to me when I'm uh, tuning my son, who I feel like is very, you know, un, non, not yet, you know, corrupted by the world yet. It's just a little guy and uh, doesn't, he does his, let me put it this way. His astral body isn't completely uh, set in. So <laughs> Steiner would say, so yeah, it's, it's a, it's a really fun, but I'm m much more fonder of tuning people who I don't have a, a relationship with. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I've asked you. Oh, go ahead, Eileen. Well, you know, I was just saying again, like uh, when I tuned my husband, it was a first aid kind of thing that, that I was able to help him with that, you know? So that 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 is easy for the most part just coming in with like oh your knee hurts well let's sort that out versus um you know going <laughs> poking around in the relationship zone or <laughs> those kind of more more intimate um interpersonal things because um having having it's impossible to be objective i think and i think so much of being a successful tuner is really staying in that that neutral witness kind of place. So, yeah. Chance. Well, uh, one more question for you while we got you, man, I maybe have two, <laughs> but you know, you can be brief. What about putting yourself on the table? Is that something you've, uh, I'm sure it's probably something you've experimented with, like for working with yourself as the remote turn tuning client, more or less. Yeah, well, you know, it's really interesting because th that honestly never occurred to me for so many years because I, I, my trauma response was to be very other oriented. And, uh, and people sort of ask me, you know, do you do this on yourself? I'm like, I don't know, it's boring. I don't do it on myself, whatever. <laughs> like, I just Sounds like me. I wasn't really interested in doing it on myself. The very first time that I ever worked on myself, I had an incredibly profound experience. So I was in a Faraday cage the California Institute for Human Science. And I was doing uh, an experiment with a biophoton counter and a thermometer um, and a group distance session. So I had 333 people sign up to volunteer to be part of this group distance session. And so I had to go into the Faraday cage for an hour by myself as a control. And then, uh, and then I had to go in for an hour tuning the whole group. Okay. And so... I'm in there by myself in the dark in this Faraday cage. And I'm like, well, I might as well tune myself as the control. And I think this is the first time I ever actually tune myself because one of the things I would say is, is that in tuning there, there's a triangulation and a witnessing that happens when, you know, I'm witnessing what you're doing, the fork is there and, and that witness piece is really important. So if you're, Tuning yourself, you don't you don't have that witness, right? That's what I said to a bunch of people. <laughs> anyway, I, I go to this Faraday cage and I'm I'm tuning the heart. This is what the tuning is on, and it's on self-love. And I find something in my own field on the right side from like age three, pretty big trespass that happened to me at that age. Uh, and I'd uncovered it in other parts of the field with other people working on me. 
but I never considered it in the biofield anatomy saying yes when you mean no um, kind of zone. And it was so powerful and it was so moving for me to be in my, with my three-year-old in this traumatic situation on the right side of my heart. And in that moment, I realized that I was being witnessed by God. And I was like, oh, <laughs> like we always have a witness. All right. It was it was so stunning. I mean, it was just such a stunning revelation to be in that pain and realize that I had a witness. That I had an absolute compassionate, present witness to that. And um, and what was interesting about that particular experiment was that I had observed when I was doing group distance sessions that the temperature would go up in the room. Um, and so I, I had this little, you know, thermometer that you could plug USB that you could put in a computer and it, it went up half a degree when I was in there by myself and it went up three degrees when I had 330 people in that Faraday cage with me energetically, it's which like was really three, pretty three, three, wild. triangulation, three points. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Marty. I don't know. But, but anyway, that was the very first time that I worked on myself. And I realized that, wow, you can work on yourself at a distance. Um, but Chase, what I generally do is like, if I feel like I need to work on myself for whatever reason, I will record it and I will turn it into a group distance session so that it's not just me standing there or spending an hour tuning myself, but it's me recording me tuning the field that I am part of. <laughs> and so I just put myself in a group. Um, but then other times I have done, there was one time where I got into the ancestral river on my mom's side and into a, like a whole bunch of poverty consciousness stuff that was really deep, you know, from Irish, the potato famine, whatever, just very Trump war kind of stuff. And I wasn't even tired, but that tuning was so powerful and went so deep in my ancestry um, that it knocked me out for three hours. Like I basically finished the tuning, fell over, passed out. For three hours, woke up full drool. <laughs> you know, I was like, what just happened? I just knocked myself out <laughs> um, with that tuning. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I didn't, didn't believe it was possible for a long time, then discovered it was and discovered we are witnessed. Um, but for the most part, I still do kind of find it boring to go poking around in my own field by myself. Yeah, there's a, at least some element of self tuning to tune others, you know, yeah. it's like, you can't really recognize something out of whack in, unless you would know that it's out of whack if it was in yourself or you've gone through that shift. Like, uh, <laughs> I think that's part of what makes uh, an effective tuner overall is that uh, not only do they see where the imbalance is, but they've gone through that lesson or are currently working through that lesson themselves so that they know what, in terms of the psychology of it, like, here's your belief that's holding this energy back. Here's what you would do to to liberate that. Like you kind of have to know it through lived experience for the epiphany to even be available to you. So there's a, rem, a constant reminder, a constant flow of reminders of what the optimal mindset, thinking pattern, mental post-it notes to notify you of when you're you're getting off balance in your thinking. You know all of that that is uh, necessary to even be effective at this, in my opinion. Not saying that I'm like enlightened and fully healed or perfect or don't have my own issues, but at least <laughs> I can at least give the right answer on the test, whether or not I do that always in my life, that's between me and my life, but you know what I mean, right? Yeah, no, totally. Um, there has to be some, some good self-awareness in order to help others to be self-aware of themselves or to understand what it is you're encountering. And you have to care, right? I, I think that's the biggest ingredient is that that you have to really care right kyle you care about your clients your customers your plants your you know you care chance you care right i mean i care I, and i and i and that is why i do it because i because i care and i'm interested and i want to help so that's my that, biggest uh, anxiety when i was getting into this is like i just really hope that i did a good job i please let me actually help please make this actually effective now i i don't really have an anxiety about that i still have an absolute pure, constantly held uh, intention to want to help. But that's absolutely the case. Like it was painfully so at first, whenever I was gaining confidence in the process. 
Yeah, when I, I was very lucky because when I first started off, I didn't have any expectations at all. I was like, what's happening? <laughs> and I was so unattached to the outcome because it was pure research and science. So whenever people did report that they were better, I was like, wow, bonus. But I didn't know that was going to happen. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have to suffer any of that performance anxiety because there was I didn't there was no right way. <laughs> I gave myself a tuning the other day and I learned. Um, so I love, I really enjoy giving myself tuning be because uh, I get to come down to the basement and just be by myself for a little while and really be beside myself and tune it, listen into my, the stories that, uh, that I haven't heard about myself. And the one that I found was when I was, uh, just one and a half years old, discovering that I was going to be a brother, like what that meant to me as a, as a human being to have to share mommy's attention, you know? <laughs> oh yeah. I had to iron that, that one out in a self tuning. And uh, <laughs> I, I never ever, you know, th thought about that, but it was, it was right there, clearly there. And I was trying to find, cause I had like this very strange uh, in like injury come up with my, with my left foot. And I can't explain it. Really can't explain it. Don't, I don't have any way to, like oh, I jumped off something or I kicked something. No, I just all of a sudden it just started really hurting. So I was like, "This is gonna be this is gonna be awesome." I'm totally gonna find out what it is, and uh, and it was there. That's where it was. It was like way, way, way out there. And so I just followed that followed that in, and I found some other stuff that I that I had to uh, think about and and really um, I don't know find some find some peace with and take away you know bring that bring that. Uh, sin back, I suppose, I suppose you could say, and uh, claim it, you know, it's my story after all. And I didn't realize it was there for me to claim. And uh, so that was, that was really fun. It's really beautiful. And it also gives me a lot of perspective just as like a, you know, I'm not like begging for clients or whatever, but I really do like to have, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, um, to be able to, to have a little bit more experience. So I'm like, all right, well, who's going to, who's going to join me at 11 PM tonight? Oh, me, <laughs> I'll be there. And so it's, I think it's really fun at this point, at least um, I'm having fun with it. Nice. I, in terms of the, like being a, becoming a brother, what I had to, what I had to like iron out in terms of that, and it's going to be different for different people, but I was an easygoing, very low impact child. My sister came into the world when I'm about three and a half. And she's like demanding. <laughs> she knows she is. I'm not like, I'm not talking smack, <laughs> but m mom's attention or else like at all times, if I, and I was, you know, that was when I moved off into becoming more independent and self-entertaining, which I have, I'm plenty good at that. And I like that. But what I learned was that uh, a big chunk of my life, I had, I realized why a big chunk of my life I had stayed in uh, not good relationships, relationships that weren't good for me even way past the expiration date because I, that little kid version of self was living for feminine approval, regardless of if it was like, was actually <laughs> a good female to have the approval from. And so in relationships where that dynamic was withheld or like almost weaponized in a manip manipulative way, I was super susceptible to that. And even was inviting those type of situations. Uh, because it was like a recurrent of uh, a pattern that even though it wasn't good for me, I was comfortable because it was what's normal. And that's the kind of thing that can really level you up in life is to figure out those motivating principles and then align them to what's actually healthy for yourself. But we're, we're getting close to the end, Eileen. I would love to hear if you've got closing thoughts or you want to share like a, a recent fun tuning success story you're aware of or you know whatever comes to mind it's been a blast hanging out again this is this is great yeah i know it's always fun hanging out uh, with you chance in video or in person and great to meet you kyle i hope that we get to hang out somewhere somehow and i definitely want to hear some updates about what you're learning and tuning your plants and 
I love your little guy. I, I love kids with tuning forks. It's just the best. <laughs> they're so, they're so, like you said, the way that they can get great sound out of them and just the purity and innocence and curiosity and the way they take to them is so great. Um, well, let's see. I've got a few in person events coming up that I'd love to invite people to. I'm going to uh, obviously be at Confluence in just a couple of weeks in Bandera, Texas at Sovereignty Ranch. Um, I'm going to be at Music and Sky in uh, in California, and that's on the summer solstice. Um, I'm going to be at Victor Wooten's Spirit of Music Camp in Nashville in August. So anybody that loves Victor Wooten and the bass, um, there's an incredible camp. I had such a magical time there last year at Wooten Woods Campground. Um, I'm going to, I'm doing Sing the Body Electric. So people who are interested in toning and making some sound with their voices, I'm going to be at uh, Kripalu in Lenox, Mass, July 5th through 7th. And that is a rocking good time. Um, I'm also going to be at Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, New York in May, um, teaching uh, how, just like a basic class on tuning forks and voice for health. So kind of a good introductory, let's hang out and play with forks and voice and see what we can do with them just as a, as a self-care kind of uh, practice. Um, and those are all on my website. Uh, so you can find that at biofieldtuning.com. Um, I love in-person events. I love hugs. <laughs> I love hanging out, you know, off script and with all the great people that are there. Um, so I would love to see uh, some people at any of these fun events that I'll be at. Yeah, Eileen's a lot of fun in real life. I highly recommend it. Get out to any of those that you can. Thanks, Chance. <laughs> awesome. So, you know, you've been, you've been, uh, oh, Kylie, you got, you got thoughts. Go ahead, buddy. Sure, you might want to say something to our our guru of tuning here. Yeah, actually, I just got a really brief uh, plant walk story for you, if you don't mind. So, in uh, you know, in, in in learning about plants and the way that they come to us, you, there's the signatures where we can find things through the site, through the um, you know the way that they look, the the color of the the flower, for example, to, describes the vibration or the shape, describes where it might work in the body, and then the smell how you know the flavor of there's a variety of flavors and how they impact the body the bitterness as i was talking about earlier how it helps with digestion we got those senses then we also have the way that it feels the texture of it and then the fifth sense is something that you don't really find so much in plants it's the sense of sound so how this how a plant a plant sounds like the auditory aspect of a plant is kind of rare and when we find that, that in a plant, it's usually an indication. Uh, it is To me, it's the sense that is bringing us to this liminal space that we're walking as in doing this type of work that we're doing, where we are simultaneously on an uh, objective layer, but also finding ourselves in dream time. And so the story is, I'm taking myself and... Uh, ancient Greek poet along and, and maybe a Native American um, from, you know, the Mi'kmaq tribe. And we're going on a little herb walk. We're going down the hill and we get to the willow tree that's by the water and I talk about how the, you know, the element of the water is there. The willow is sacred to the water. There's the sun coming up. There's the, the way that the willow leaf is shaped is that it terminates right in the middle so uh, it's, it's equal uh, on the stem. And when it blows in the wind, they have a percussive sound, but they're really gentle. And so with the wind and the sun reflecting on the water and the, and the greenness, there would be no doubt to this ancient Greek that the muses live in this tree. Like that is the thing. Like there, I could, there's be no way that I could convince him otherwise, him or her. And that's what they say, that the sound of the muses lives in the willow trees. And so there's we leave the Greek, the ancient Greek poet behind. He's got a scroll. He's hanging out in the branches. And we, the shaman, Native American shaman, we go up the hill to a tree called the honey locust tree. And I describe, you know, the honey locust. And it was named by the, um, 
the settlers that came here, the locust and what the locust means. And it also has a relationship with the, the word lobster. And that's because it looks, the fruit looks like a carob. It looks like a carob. And the word carob is where we get the word carrot, which is like weights and measures and all this stuff. And let's just imagine that we've been there for a whole season. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, the, uh, the, the leaves blow off. And the only thing that remains is the sound of the tree blowing in the wind. And when it does, it has this rattling nature to it. And so here we have this like serpentine coiled Fibonacci perfect, you know, uh, representations of the cyclical nature of the world. And they become, they become rattles. And to me, it's like these, this, the sound of nature that's giving a, that, you know, that's in the, the trees, that's in the willows, that's in the, the honey locust that I use these in um, sessions, by the way. That's all there to remind us also that everything is available for us to tune into and, um, and that everything has the capacity to tune. Um, even just looking today at the robin, they, the robins just, they do this fun thing where they do one, two, three steps, and then they put their ear down like that to the ground. One, two, three, ear down. And by the way, when I do this at home in front of my two-year-old, he goes crazy, he thinks it's the funniest thing in the world. So, um, and so they're just tuning, listening for the worms. They're, they have their feet on the ground. They're feeling for the worms. They got their sight. They have all their senses available. And um, so I, one of the things that I just wanted to say with, with that in, you know, in closing is that how much I appreciate the sensory aspect of biofield tuning. We're not just listening. There's so much more um, to, a, available. And it's all there encoded in nature as well. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very fun to learn. And I just have so much gratitude for uh, the, the, what you've paved, Eileen, and for what you've brought, Chance, and also for being here tonight. It's just awesome. So thank you so much. Nice. Thanks, Kyle. It's great to meet you. Yeah, that was lovely, man. And uh, Eileen, I know you've, you've been uh, at it a long day with podcasts, so I'll let you go if you want to hop off. I'm going to hang back for a little bit with the people, but it's been a real blessed birthday stream. I really appreciate it. It's super fun to hang. Look nice. forward to the next time it's in person. That sounds great. Okay. Bye, everybody. Much love. Thanks, Take care. Bye-bye. Oh, ain't she great? <laughs> the best. She's the, yeah, she's the best. You can just hear it in her voice, the, the coherence. And... That's really what our role with nature is, is that coherence, like here, like that co-witness hearing the same thing, you know, that's what reality is. That's what consciousness is getting, getting through these filtration systems that we've built up to protect ourselves from what it is that we imagined that we're afraid of when it's all like, all actually was the will of God to begin with. And our free won't is what put up those filters. I think that's kind of the theme of this chat. So everybody out there wanted to let you know if you want to do a tuning with me or, or with Kyle, I'll let him tell you how you would get a hold of him for that. But uh, my website, interversepodcast.com slash sound dash healing is where you'll find the description of what my process is like, how you might uh, get signed up for a session, or you can just straight email me chance at interversepodcast.com. That's going to be linked in the show notes. Uh, Eileen's biofield tuning website is also going to have a list of practitioners. If you want to try somebody else that's out there, she's trained thousands and I, I'm just happy if more people are getting tuned or practicing tuning. She offers training courses through her website. You can be part of that movement, which is also really great. If you feel like you just want the whole full meal deal of best practices, but like Kyle and I are living examples that this is, there's a reality to this process because you can figure it out for yourself. <laughs> We've both done that. We're both in the process of furthering that journey and developing it. And I kind of like that because it just feels so real. Uh, every time I make a, a new discovery <laughs> in the biofield about how something might work for somebody, it's just like science, it's super fun. But how would people get a hold of you for a tuning, Kyle? Uh, it's on my website. You go to consults. There's a few different options. There's a pit stop at the shop, which is what I'm used to. People just come in and we just chat and I make them something. 
Uh, I do my typical herbal consults, and then I have the biofield tuning, which involves that uh, remedy that's mixed up for you for from the tuning, as I was describing, and that's really fun. And um, yeah, tippycanoeherbs.com. You can uh, apply uh, the Interverse code. That's Interverse, all caps, for our products. And um, that's really fun. You get a discount for that. And uh, yeah, that helps support Chance as well. And yeah. Oh, dude, we are making, right now, we're making the Aries box sets. I'm going to send you one, by the way. It's your uh, birthday gift. And so that's one thing I'm really excited about because we've been making these zodiacal box sets. And so the Aries one is coming up and the Aries incense is so badass. It's got dragon's blood and cinnamon and copal and oh my gosh, it's just lovely. It's really, really nice. And so burning some of that, just feeling the spark, feeling the, the spring, you know, let's get up and go energy and uh, courage. God, I've been feeling it. <laughs> yeah, I call I call Pisces season pre-Aries. That's what I call it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, to me, it starts kicking in uh, pretty strong uh, about midway through March at, or a little sooner. And I've really grabbed that bull by the horns, so to speak, um, and making that pun intentionally because the new thing that's kicked off for me in this getting started in this part of the year is the Inner World podcast with me and Dylan Sicosio. The uh, like, it's the dream come true of prepared deep research podcast with Dylan that I've always kind of wanted to do with him, but you know, he rightly want, withholds that level of dedication and commitment from people that aren't going to support directly because the, it's a uh, topics that those who aren't invested in wanting to learn uh, are sometimes a bit combative at the, you know, the, the tapestry that pulling on that truth thread starts to weave even though it's very beautiful, you know, but <laughs> our, our members only side is, is super fun. You get to experience Dylan in a sort of a different light as you like, it feels like me and him are just hanging out and it's the type of conversations me and him have off the air about the spiritual, mythological, linguistic syncretism that both of us are so into rather than him, you know, talking to the the audience or the masses so much. It's like, it's the, it's kind of, you kind of feel like you're getting into his heart a little bit and he's a great guy. He has a huge heart and the research has just been phenomenal. So if you want to be, if you want to give me a birthday present, give yourself a present, you be like cucumber who during this stream signed up for the membership through YouTube, which is a new thing. You can do that. So here's my page. If you're on my page, go look for this join button right here. And that's eight bucks a month. Uh, it's a little more than my Patreon because YouTube takes a much bigger fee. But if you like the YouTube interface, that's one way to do it. Or you can just join through Patreon. There's already two episodes of this Inner World show, and we've got a third one that I'm going to be putting out tomorrow that I'm super excited about. I'll, I'll play us out at the end with the intro sequence for that episode just to get everybody fired up. But the third episode's about the tor symbolism like towers the bull tar and everything that might spiral out of starting to investigate that particular weave of how a hornism is part of it like you know moses has horns and the the tyrrhenians who are the ancient italians also like phoenician ancient italians how they uh, were potentially called so because of towers. So we're really looking at like the connection between towers and bulls and all the other things related. You know, it's a huge circle that keeps coming back around to itself. It's a really good episode. This one clocked in at two hours and 15 minutes. So the whole thing is pure research too. It's like, you know, we do get into some tangents, but they're good tangents. <laughs> Dylan's here actually he says holla can't wait to hear the latest one chance is making some Michael Jordan level discoveries as well yeah it's just like awesome teamwork I feel like me and him have have developed a an, a really good way of of building off of each other's insights because with this stuff is like things are right there under your nose you've got a lot of the you got a lot of the data points but sometimes just making one dot to dot connection all of a sudden reveals uh, I would like to solve the puzzle. 
<laughs> you know, now you're ready. You got enough vowels or whatever. That's totally how this inner world podcast feels. It's been awesome. So I'm really excited about that. And there's great content coming up on just the interverse side as well, which you get access to the extended shows. If you join my Patreon or join this YouTube membership. So if you want to do yourself a, a favor, if you're interested in these, these things and you want to do me a birthday present, get yourself a membership. It's, you know, it doesn't hurt to just try it out for a month. You're going to be very glad you did. You don't, there's nothing like it out there, especially the inner world stuff. Nothing at all like it anywhere other than going to Dylan's Substack and reading uh, or, you know, getting the audiobooks, the spirit world audiobooks, or reading the spirit world books. But that's it. I just wanted to make sure everybody knows that that's an option, that it's crushing, like really crushing. <laughs> and it's just going to get better as we keep pulling, uh, pulling ourselves along on that stream of, of uh, mystic insight. Super cool. Yeah. Kyle, you got anything else you want to tell people or just to respond? Happy birthday, to man. Love you. Happy uh, uh, cheers to the chat. It's been awesome. Always love hanging out with you. Love uh, love the invitation, man. Thank you so much. This is great. I just appreciate that you're able to make some arrangements and pop in with this. It was a huge treat for me to see you and Eileen have a mind meld. <laughs> That's honestly like the, the main, sometimes it's not like that, but the my favorite thing about Vibrant is the potential to bring together podcast guests who would otherwise never interact in a podcast, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and that that is i think that's like the most fun thing about this so if Good anybody Thank you. i'm actually down for suggestions if anybody thinks of past guests on interverse or or on vibrant that you think would be cool to see interact uh feel free to let us know in the vibrant telegram or in the interverse telegram i'm totally uh willing to entertain some wild combinations i think that's always the value of this show is uh plugging into some newness in that way. Cool. Cool. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll take off guys. Appreciate everyone being here. This was great. Going to enjoy the rest of my birthday week. Birthdays on Friday. I got the skull and boner 322 birthday, making it cool. And, uh, all right. Love you, buddy. See you guys later. Much love. And this is the, in, this is the intro to inner world episode three. So, you know, get yourself fired up with some, some bulls and cows. <laughs>